so I just want to thank the organizers for asking me to speak. Um, I've only been given 10 minutes to talk about why resist 2010. Uh, this doesn't give me very much time and I've had to leave a few things off the list. A few things like the fact that it's costing us six billion dollars. Like the theft of indigenous land and resources, the death of indigenous elder Harriet Nahaney, clear cuts, mountain blasting, road and traffic expansion, gravel mining, and destruction of habitat and wildlife. It's history of political oppression, such as the murder of 300 students in Mexico prior to the 1968 games, oppression of activists in China in 2008, and the entire 1936 games in Nazi Germany. I've also had to lead out, leave out Van Eyck's idea of harm reduction, which is passing out condoms, glow sticks, and hot pads to tourists, the over 16,000 police, military, and security personnel in the city over the games, the Olympic budget that went $100 million over budget, and did I mention that it's costing us $6 billion for a two-week party that most people won't even attend. You get the picture. There's a lot of reasons why we should resist 2010. I'm going to focus on a few. Um, I'm going to first look at the impact the Games has had on housing in Vancouver, especially low-income housing. There's a long history of displacement caused by the Games. In the last 50 years, more than 2 million people have been displaced by the Olympics, and Vancouver has added now to those numbers. Since we won the bid in 2003, the downtown east side has seen the closure of over 1,000 units of low-income housing, all of which are in some way connected to Olympic development and the ongoing gentrification of the downtown east side, which has been exacerbated by the Games and the land grab by developers who are in bed with Van Ock as seen most recently by the Concord Pacific signing on as an Olympic sponsor. The so-called housing legacy that was, left, that was to be left by the 2010 Games included the construction of affordable housing in the Athletes' Village, protection of rental housing stock, the assurance that people would not be made homeless, and that no one be, displa be displaced or face eviction due to the Games, and that all inner city residents would have continued access to public spaces before, during, and after the Games. So what's really happened? The Athletes Village was supposed to provide an equal mix of low and medium income housing. That plan has been completely disregarded and now less than 20% of the units will go to medium income housing, not even low income housing. Further, the city has refused to, to support their existing legislation that has resulted in the shutdown of numerous single room occupancy hotels including the American Hotel, the Piccadilly Hotel, the Backpackers Hotel, the Dominion Hotel, and that list goes on. Many of those which are now being used as budget Olympic accommodations. The city has also implemented Project Civil City, a social cleansing program, criminalizing poor people with major penalties for minor violations, such as jaywalking, panhandling, or biking without a helmet. Most of those timeline projections for Project Civil City were to end January 2010. <clears throat> Add to this the most recent Olympic Kidnapping Act, or the Assistance to Shelter Act, which allows police to forcefully remove homeless people and take them to shelters. Finally, the closure of Pigeon Park, Oppenheimer Park, and Crab Park have all limited the access to public space that many people in our community call home. So another reason to resist the Olympics is the long-term effect the Olympics will have on our city, our province, and our communities. Olympic host cities take on huge debts to host the two-week party. For example, the debt for the 1976 Olympics was only paid off in 2002. Calgary had a, a $910 million debt, and Sydney was left with a debt of $2.3 billion. Vancouver will not be any different, and for years after the Olympics are over and the eyes of the world have left Vancouver, we will still be dealing with the cost of this inane two-week party. Some of the major costs we are paying for include the Richmond Indoor Speed Skating Oval, $125 million, the Whistler Sliding Centre, $43 million, the Olympic Village, $76 million, the Whistler Nordic Centre, $120 million, and the curling rink at the Hillcrest Park Stadium, $23 million. Although some may argue that curling rink, speed skating ovals, and sliding centers are crucial for community development, I think that housing, healthcare, and education are a little more important. <clears throat> right
Right now, more than half of all the elementary schools in Vancouver are in desperate need of necessary structural improvements. We have a housing crisis in Vancouver that requires money to build new houses. Our healthcare system is also desperately in need of cash flow. So what will happen after the games are over, corporate sponsors have left, and Vanock is no longer under the spotlight? Workers will be laid off, social services will be depleted and scaled back, and we will suffer as we slowly pay off the $6 billion debt. The list could certainly go on, <clears throat> and I'm sure we're going to hear a few more reasons why the Olympics are not good for our communities, but why should we resist? Well, because we ha although we haven't stopped the Olympics from happening, we have been successful in disrupting the Games. Since 2003, activists and community members have driven Vanock and their public events underground. The disruption of the Olympic clock unveiling and the flag lighting ceremony and other events resulted in Vanock no longer having public events in the lead up to the Games. The theft of the Olympic flag by the Native Warrior Society brought the issue of Eagle Ridge Bluffs and the death of Harriet Nahaney into the forefront of public discussion. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and the tireless efforts of people in Vancouver and across the country has resulted in the lack of Olympic spirit, even with only three weeks to go. So this is why we resist. The Olympic Resistance Network has called for a convergence from February 10th to February 15th. This is a call for any and all who oppose the Olympics in one form or another to join in the resistance. And this can take many forms, and this is the shameless plug for everyone to get involved. Uh, most of this information that I'm going to reference is available on the back table, um, that, the ORN table in the back. Uh, February 10th to 11th, there will be a conference with workshops about the corporatization of the Olympics, the tar sands and indigenous resistance, Olympic displacement, and, and lots more. Uh, February 12th, there will be a large demonstration hosted by the 2010 Welcoming Committee. Take Back the City, which is what it was, what is called, will be a lively public festival starting at the Vancouver Art Gallery and then a parade to the BC Place Stadium beginning at 3 p.m. Uh, and then from the 13th through to the 15th, there will be various days of action focusing on housing and displacement, ecological destruction, and the corporatization of the games. There are many ways to get involved other than being a part of the demonstrations. The Olympic Resistance Network is in need of food and people who want to cook food, child care supplies, and volunteers to staff the welcoming centers and the legal centers. We have a long wish list of things that I'm sure people have sitting around in their homes that they could donate. Um, supplies need for cooking, medics, communication, transportation, um, and people who are willing to open up their homes for people that are coming here from all over the place for the convergence. And we're also fundraising for our Legal Defense Fund. Um, there are copies of the wish list for the ORN on the back table. Uh, I hope people will be able to stop by. There's a sign-up sheet. You can get on the list, find out what's going on, and get involved. Thank you.